to today's episode of Myeloma Crowd Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom. We'd like to thank our episode sponsor, Bristol Myers Squibb, for their support of this Myeloma Crowd Radio show program. Now, before we get started with today's show, I'd just like to wish you all a happy new year. This is our first show of the year, and share one of our New Year's goals with you at the Myeloma Crowd by Health Tree. Uh, our theme this year is one of change. We see so much change happening in myeloma treatment options like the one we're going to hear about today and many others that we heard about um, potentially at ASH. Um, and it's, a, it's so, such exciting change. We are so on board with change. Um, as an organization, we are trying to change the way research is performed by myeloma investigators by providing them a free access to Health Tree Cure Hub Real World data where we now have over 10,000 myeloma patients participating to help them perform faster and less expensive research for us. The tool allows them to to develop new insights and hypotheses with validated and anonymized data. And to our knowledge, this is the largest and most comprehensive data set in the world for myeloma patients. So we'll be issuing a call for proposals, um, research proposals later this year to invite greater use of our platform now that we've performed some initial surveys and studies and have gained some experience with that. So we invite you to participate in this amazing tool because it can help you navigate your myeloma care at the same time that you're contributing for change in myeloma research. Um, One more thing, because our theme is change, we're also launching a Change for Change initiative where you can donate your spare change uh, with daily purchases that you may make using an app. You just kind of round up. So you can learn more about that on myelomacrowd.org. So they're now on to our show. There's so much going on in the development of multiple myeloma therapies, and we are so fortunate that that wheel keeps turning to identify new options for myeloma patients. We already know that there's so much happening in immunotherapies like CAR-T and bispecific antibodies, but as um, this program has always shared up-and-coming treatments with you as early as possible. So today's show, we'll discuss one new therapy called and I'm not going to guess the name right, just Gwenamod, <laughs> that's in early clinical trials. You'll have to correct me, and um, Dr. Vogel and Dr. Nefodova. So welcome to the program to both of you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jamie. And, and you pronounced and, it exactly right. Did I? Okay, good. And let me give an introduction for you both before we get started. Um, Dan Vogel is director of the Abrams Abramson Cancer Center Clinical Research Unit and Associate Professor of Medicine and Faculty Fellow for the Center for Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Vogel leads multi-center multiple myeloma clinical research and studies, including study of protein degradation pathways, international studies of new myeloma therapies like proteasome inhibitors, XPO1 inhibitors, and determinants of health, of health um, and others. As the director of the clinical research unit at UPenn, which has very deep and very early expertise in immunotherapy, Dr. Vogel is leading the way to get revolutionary treatments like CAR-T therapy and other immunotherapies into the myeloma clinic. He helped to create national studies, including randomized trials uh, that run through the NIH-sponsored Bone Marrow Transplant Clinic Trials Network, and does analysis of myeloma transplant data from the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research, which is called CIBMTR. We recently interviewed Dr. Vogel at ASH on another treatment clinical trial he's leading called TAK573, in addition to the one we'll be discussing today. So look for that article on the Myeloma Crowd website because it's another exciting new option. And um, we were talking that we might need to do a second show on that one later this year because it's so interesting. Um, Dr. Vogel's awards include the Bradley Award in Patient-Oriented Research at the Department of Medicine at at UPenn, ASCO Foundation Career Development Award, an LLS uh, Fellow in Clinical Research Award, an ASH Scholar Award, and the Brian Dury Humanitarian Award in the Philadelphia Myeloma Networking Group. Also with us today is Dr. Yulia Nefedova, who is Associate Professor of Immunology in the Microenvironment and Mestatus program at the Worcester Institute in Philadelphia, and she is also adjunct associate professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Drexel University College of Medicine. Um, Her awards include a Russian Academy of Science Fellowship Award, the Ruth Kirstenstein um, National Research Service Award, Miles for Moffitt Milestone Award, and an MMRF Senior Award. 
Um, Dr. Nefedova is going to join us for the first part of the show to help us better understand the science behind this new therapy today. So let's get started. Um, Dr. Vogel, maybe you can give us a broad overarching perspective. So what's the rationale behind this therapy in the context of other myeloma treatments, um, like other immunotherapies or even other um, regular myeloma therapies? So first of all, thanks so much for having us on the show. It's really a lot of fun to talk about this uh, clinical trial and uh, the collaboration that I've had with Dr. Nefedova over the past few years, taking a lot of the work that she's done in the laboratory and coming up with new ideas of how to treat myeloma and then being able to move that into the clinic while also getting samples from our patients who are in the trial and sending them back over to her lab to figure out if this these kinds of treatments work in patients the same way that they do in her laboratory models. <clears throat> the rationale behind this particular trial, uh, I think, comes from understanding that up until now, most of our myeloma therapies have really been aimed directly at the myeloma cells so that we give treatments that we think go into the myeloma cell and interfere with some basic process that they need to stay alive and to grow. And we've just recently started doing treatments that really are immunotherapy that convince immune cells to directly attack the myeloma cell. But at the same time, both of those types of treatments can run into problems when the myeloma cells are protected by signals and support that they get from other cells that live in what we call the bone marrow microenvironment. That there are lots of other cells that live in the bone marrow normally, and that somehow in the setting of multiple myeloma, some of those cells provide direct support to the myeloma cells to stay alive, and others can provide signals to immune cells that tell them to stay away. And so that can really interfere with the effectiveness of all of these types of myeloma treatments that we use now by protecting the myeloma cells themselves or by tamping down the anti-myeloma immune responses that we're trying to enlist in our immunotherapies. And so the idea that targeting the bone marrow microenvironment is a good thing to do is something that's come up um, over the past, uh, you know, recent years. And uh, there's a lot of exciting work done on figuring out which cells are the problem there and which signals we could attack or block to make our other myeloma therapies more efficacious. Yeah, so interesting. And a totally different type of therapy, right? I mean, this is this is not like anything else that's in the myeloma arsenal right now. Correct. Or or at least right now the cell the the treatments that we have at least don't have a clear ro- or, or it isn't clear that they're the main way that they work is by targeting the bone marrow microenvironment. There are some treatments that we use. For instance, uh, the bisphosphonate therapies like zoledronate, also known as Zomeda, or, or denosumab, also known as Exgeva, which we give to help protect uh, the bones in multiple myeloma, may also have some effect on other cells in the bones, near the bone marrow that can participate in a feedback loop. And so some of the treatments that we use already may have some effects on the bone marrow microenvironment, and that might be part of how they work and how they help people, but they weren't necessarily developed that way. And so there aren't many treatments, even in clinical trials right now, that are truly aimed at modifying the bone marrow microenvironment as the primary mechanism of action and and the main way that we think they're going to work. And it sounds like the bone marrow microenvironment, I've heard a lot of myeloma um, researchers talk about how critical that is to the development and how you know, like one person's bone marrow microenvironment might be different from somebody else's, and and that's maybe why people get different responses or a different clone grows out or things like that. 
Yeah, there's still a lot to learn. And, you know, some of what I've been working on with Dr. Nefedova is taking samples from patients, uh, both blood samples to understand the immune system and bone marrow samples, so that we can look at the cells that are in the bone marrow and that she can start to tease out. And it's a complicated process to figure this out. And there are a lot of different tests that one could do to understand different aspects of all of those cells there. And there's really a big mix of them. So it's a, it's a complicated problem to tease out, and any individual treatment is going to kind of chip away at one aspect of that. But if we can really show that we're starting to make a difference and then combine the attack on the bone marrow microenvironment supportive signals or immunosuppressive signals with other effective myeloma therapies, there's the chance to really improve treatment overall. Yeah, so interesting. Well, Dr. Nefedova, I know you have just a few minutes to be with us um, this morning, so we're going to let you go first. Um, about what are uh, th- this target? Or you're talking about myeloid-derived suppressor cells, or MDSCs. So maybe you can give us a broad overview, maybe in language that we're capable of understanding. Yeah. Because I know uh, you're very <laughs> smart about this. Um, about about what are they and how do they work? Uh, of course. Uh, so our, bo- our body has a large of number of cells uh, that are called neutrophils and monocytes. And these cells are actually defenders. They developed to protect us from infection uh, caused bacteria um, and viruses. But in cancer, tumor cells start producing many factors that convert some of these protective neutrophils and monocytes uh, into cells that actually inhibit the immune system. And uh, now we know many mechanisms uh, by which, which this change, this conversion is happening uh, in cancer. Uh, but as a result of this conversion, neutrophils and monocytes that are defenders turned into pathologically activated neutrophils and monocytes. And pathologically activated means that these cells do not defend us anymore, but instead um, they help cancer to grow. And... Um, these pathologically activated neutrophils and monocytes are actually called myeloid-derived suppressor cells, or MDSC. And um, there are many ways by which these MDSC um, help cancer to grow. First of all, they have multiple way, ways to deactivate cells of immune systems that are called T cells and natural killer cells that actually kill tumor cells. And at the same time, MDSC promote growth of new blood vessels, and also they change the architecture of tumor surroundings uh, that help tumor to grow and spread. And uh, one of the mechanisms by which MDSC helps cancer to grow is actually production of S100A9 protein. Um, Also, I want to say that at any given moment uh, in cancer patients, neutrophils and monocytes that are protective and MDSC, uh, which are pathologically activated neutrophils and monocytes, uh, coexist. And the balance between these cells uh, is one of the factors that help to define the outcome and strength of immune responses. And therefore, uh, we try uh, to develop therapies that target bad cells, which, uh, which are MDSCs, and protect neutrophils and monocytes. Okay, so that those two categories together are called MDSCs, the neutrophils and monocytes together. And patients may be familiar with neutrophils because I, I know, like, doctors are watching. I just finished an immunotherapy trial, and they're watching my neutrophil count all the time to, to see what's happening. So patients may be familiar with those these, these two categories, I guess, of white blood cells, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, they are. And, and, in fact, your doctors were probably keeping an eye on your monocytes as well. They're just a Mm -hmm. lot less frequently seen in the blood, more often seen in the bone marrow. And so you don't usually notice the counts. They're also, we don't follow their levels as much in terms of keeping track of whether patients are really at risk for an infection like we do with the neutrophil count. Uh, which Mm -hmm. is often something that we keep close track of in clinical medicine. And I think the key point that Dr. Nefedova was making is that these MDSCs 
are very mm -hmm. similar to the helpful protective neutrophils and monocytes. So it can be tricky to figure out how to kill off, for instance, the MDSCs that are helping the cancer to grow while leaving in place the protective neutrophils and monocytes that keep us safe from infection. And there's a lot of complicated work going into figuring out, well, what makes the MDSCs different and how can we deal with them specifically? Yeah, so I guess you're saying that when they're, quote, biologically activated, then they become MDSCs, and that's kind of how you differentiate the bad from the good? Is that what you're saying? Sorry, this is a good <laughs> biology lesson for me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, they became pathologically activated uh, by uh, factors that produced by tumors. And uh, oh. because they became activated, they acquire uh, new functions. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it is tricky to uh, distinguish them from normal uh, monocytes and um, neutrophils, but now we know uh, specific uh, markers that allow us to do that. Um, and while uh, normal monocytes and neutrophils, uh, they defend us, uh, the function of um, MDC is different. They actually, they do not defend us. They help cancer to grow. Um, this is big difference between uh, these cells in um, uh, their functional uh, activity. And how do you, like you were saying, there are a lot of tests that you can do to, to try to differentiate. How How is that tested? And, like, when you look at, um, you know, like normal levels versus a myeloma patient, how how are you, is that something we should always be testing in myeloma? Oh, it's a good question. Um, so usually um, MDC levels are usually measured in blood, but they also can be um, detected in, in the bone marrow. Mm -hmm. um, so how uh, do we uh, detect MDC? So they have a specific phenotype, which means they have a specific set of markers that express on the um, cell surface. And now we know markers that uh, distinguish them actually from normal um, neutrophils and uh, monocytes. And uh, these markers could be detected uh, in the lab using flow cytometry. Um, so um, usually uh, in healthy people, only a very small uh, population of cells with similar phenotype um, exist, uh, detected, uh, could be detected in the blood. Um, usually it's between 0.5 uh, to 1 percent, uh, but could be even less. So in myeloma patients, the number of MDC um, significantly increased in several folds and can reach 8, uh, 10 percent um, and could be even higher. Uh, so uh, there is not that many studies actually, uh, you know, done uh, in myeloma uh, on MDSC. This is something which is, uh, which is uh, upcoming, uh, I believe. But um, there is a study that uh, demonstrated actually that presence of MDSC in myeloma patients are uh, significantly correlated with the stage of the disease. Mm. It's so and, interesting. And from so a, I, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say from a clinical perspective, I think it's really important you know, a lot of people listening are patients, and they're then going to start wondering, should I go out and get my level of MDSCs measured? And I think it's important to emphasize that we're really very early in the evaluation of this whole uh, branch of, of cancer therapy, so that the tests that Dr. Nefedova does in her laboratory to count up the number of MDSCs in a blood sample or in a bone marrow sample. These are tests that are not available in a regular laboratory. And even if they were, right now we wouldn't really know what to do with the information. So what you just heard is that patients who have higher numbers of MDSCs, um, or we see higher numbers of MDSCs in patients with more advanced multiple myeloma, and that's mm -hmm. not necessarily surprising that the that these higher numbers are associated with more aggressive or higher stage disease. Uh, but what to 
do about that or whether that's going to influence the success of any particular therapy is still something to be worked out. So I could imagine that in the future, if there were a treatment that worked really well for patients with high levels of MDSCs, but not very well for people who had low levels of MDSCs, we might have a test then that we could do in the laboratory, but we're still a ways away from even knowing that that would be a good thing to test for. And right now, we're really at the point of trying to understand how the levels of MDSCs or the function of MDSCs impacts the response to various therapies or specifically therapies aimed at the MDSCs, like the ones we're talking about in the trial that we're discussing today. Right. Well, the reason I asked, too, is because, you know, with all these immunotherapies, sometimes you'll hear, oh, the immune system's been exhausted or whatever. And there's a lot going on in the immune system, obviously, that's very complicated. And so looking at just understanding every aspect of it, could that be a potential marker to say, oh, this this could influence the way you react to a bispecific antibody or a CAR-T therapy or something like that? If you have high or low levels, I don't know. It just seems like the more that we can put our arms around and capture into that immune system status, I guess, would be helpful for researchers and patients. Absolutely. Um, So, and actually, oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, no, I just uh, want to mention that uh, MDC uh, have been much more extensively studied in, in the solid tumors. And in the solid tumors, there is a growing body of uh, data showing a positive correlation of presence of MDC with the stage of the disease and response to um, uh, therapy, especially with checkpoint inhibitors. And in fact, there are about 90 ongoing, currently ongoing clinical trials that actually look at the uh, level of MDC as a factor that can either predict response to checkpoint inhibitors or allow uh, to monitor the uh, effect of the therapy. Yeah, that's so interesting. I, I know, I mean, everything's being generated out of the bone marrow, right? Um, so in solid tumors, which solid tumors are being studied the most with MDSCs? Um, uh, I would say uh, lung cancer, uh, hand and neck cancer, pancreatic cancer, uh, melanoma, and many others. Mm. Oh, that's a lot. Breast cancer. Okay, and the, yeah, interesting. That's so interesting. So it's newer in blood cancers. That's so interesting. So when these MDSCs are targeted, um, they're just the supportive immune cell environment. So obviously they're not necessarily, like you said earlier, Dr. Vogel, killing the myeloma cells directly, but they're affecting this supportive environment. So are they always used, any any MDSC-type therapies, are they always used in combination with other um, more toxic or cytotoxic kind of cancer therapies? Right. So, yes, MDSC attack immune system and inactivate them, uh, which allow the tumor to grow uncontrolled. And also, actually, um, uh, MDSC uh, could interact directly with tumor cells and protect them from the effect of cancer-killing therapies, uh, which helps mm-hmm. tumor to survive and eventually uh, relapse. Um, so, in preclinical settings, in preclinical models of cancers, uh, targeting MDC alone demonstrated uh, anti-tumor effect, uh, but this effect was much more stronger when this targeting MDC was combined with, um, you know, other therapies, including checkpoint inhibitors and um, therapies that kill tumor cells. And um, our studies uh, in mouse models of myeloma uh, demonstrated anti-tumor effect of targeting MDC with uh, the screen mode. And when we combine the screen mode with um, either linalidomide, Vilcate, or exazomib, the anti-tumor effect of uh, this drug combination was significantly uh, stronger. Mm, okay, so, yeah, wonderful. And, now, and so, I don't – no, go ahead. I was just going to say what I think you're hearing – Uh, is that there is the potential for a treatment that's targeted at MDSCs to work by itself, but Mm -hmm. it may not be the strongest effect as a single agent. 
and might be really might work much better when combined with other treatments and there's a rationale to combine it with immune therapies and so in in other cancers especially lung cancer colon cancer there's these uh treatments called checkpoint inhibitors um the classic one is pembrolizumab or uh, the brand name Keytruda that can work really well to activate immune cells, especially T cells, which are the immune cells that usually have the job of killing cancer cells. And by turning the T cells on, non-specifically, just turning them on, you can get some really amazing cancer responses. That medicine has not worked particularly well in multiple myeloma, or at least the, to the extent that it worked, it was kind of balanced by some side effects, especially when combined with other myeloma treatments. <clears throat> and so that kind of immune-stimulating therapy <clears throat> is still very investigational in myeloma, and figuring out how to make it work better would be a significant step. <clears throat> but what Dr. Nefedova showed in her laboratory research in, in mice is that if you take other treatments for myeloma that are really aimed directly at the myeloma cells and trying to kill them and combine them with a way of blocking the immune suppressive and supportive signal that they can get from, from MDSCs, <clears throat> then you can really make the treatments work a lot better. And, and the medicine that you use, that we're using here, tesquinamide, blocks this one particular protein <clears throat> produced by MDSCs that signals for blood vessel growth and, and signals for suppression of the immune system um, in the bone marrow microenvironment. And this medicine, tesquinamide, uh, can block that signal. And therefore, when we combine tesquinamide with other myeloma treatments, we can see in laboratory models that that makes them work much better than they do on their own. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and Dr. Nefedova, I know you have to go. Is there anything else that you would like to share about MDSCs um, before we have Dr. Vogel talk about the trial? Um, well, uh, MDSC um, uh, has been extensively studied in uh, solid tumors, and uh, targeting MDSC was uh, successful in preclinical models. Um, and currently, there are several ongoing early stages clinical trials in solid tumors which target MDAC, um, you know, in combination with checkpoint inhibitors or chemotherapy. However, these cells are not uh, studied that well in uh, blood cancers. Um, and this is something that uh, probably emerging and uh, uh, will be um, upcoming uh, area of research. Um, so uh, it could be potentially uh, very, we believe that it could be potentially very, um, you know, successful therapy, um, especially considering the fact that blood cancer, actually specifically myeloma, uh, mm -hmm. grow in a bone marrow. Um, mm -hmm. It's a location, location with a high number of uh, MDC and place where MDC actually originate. Uh, so, of course, we don't know uh, that because we don't have data, but it's possible that um, strategies uh, targeting MDC could work even better in blood cancers. Compared yeah, that will be so interesting to see. And, well, thank you for all the lab work you're doing to understand. And I love what um, Dr. Vogel said in the beginning, how he's working with you, that you're trying to take this bench-to-bedside kind of approach to see exactly what's happening, both in your lab and then in patients in the clinic. I think that's fantastic. I thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so, Dr. Vogel, is this the first study of MDSCs in multiple myeloma? So, it's the first study that I know of where we're specifically doing a treatment that we really think is primarily targeted at MDSCs. Dr. Nefedova and I were talking recently about this, and we identified a couple of other medications that have lots of ways that they might work to help treat cancer and myeloma specifically, and that one of their effects might be that they affect MDSCs in some way. Um, 
and even all even those studies are very much in the early phases in multiple myeloma. But this treatment, this tesquinamod medication, is the only one that I know of that we think directly blocks a signal specifically that comes from these myeloid cells in the bone marrow that uh, provide the, the help provide the supportive bone marrow microenvironment to the myeloma cells. So what protein is it is tesquinamod blocking? You said it blocks blood vessel growth and then suppression it blocks the suppression that the immune system goes into when these things are when you, these MDSCs are present. Um, well, so, so the idea here is that when you when normal neutrophils and monocytes, these normal uh, mm -hmm. protective cells that are growing in the bone marrow, get into close proximity to cancer cells and specifically myeloma cells. There are some signals that go out from the myeloma cells that signal to these otherwise helpful protective immune cells to become supportive and immunosuppressive and start sending out signals to other cells in the bone marrow that cause them to be more supportive, to allow more blood vessels to grow in and provide more nutrients to the cancer cells, and then specifically to suppress T cell function in in the area right around the myeloma cells. And so the main protein that we're focusing on that are produced by the by the MDSCs is a protein that's known as S100A9. And so Dr. Nefedova noticed that this protein was probably important, specifically looked in mouse models of multiple myeloma and found that that was true, that it seemed like S100A9 production by the myeloid cells, by these MDSCs, uh, contributed to the growth of the myeloma and its ability to evade the immune system, and that if you actually got rid of S100A9, the myeloma didn't grow as well. And it turned out that there's a medicine that's been around for several years uh, that's still investigational called tesquinamod that has mm -hmm. the function of blocking S100A9. So the idea of using tesquinamod to treat cancer is not a new one. It was developed a few years ago, actually went through a very large clinical trial. Over a 1,000 patients were treated with tesquinamod. Um, and in prostate cancer patients, you could actually see that when patients got tesquinamod versus when they got a placebo pill, it took their prostate cancer longer to grow than if they just got the placebo. And so we actually had, even before starting our trial in myeloma, some evidence that tesquinamod could really have a biological effect on cancer and preventing cancer growth. Now, in prostate cancer, slowing down the growth wasn't quite a strong enough effect to get this medication uh, approved for treatment. And so it still remains investigational. But based on Dr. Nefedova's previous laboratory work and this previous clinical trial experience in other types of cancer, we were really excited to try this out in multiple myeloma, um, both by itself as a single agent and, more importantly, in combination with other myeloma therapies to truly explore whether it could augment the effectiveness of other treatments and really be an option for patients in the future. Yeah, I love that you're connecting these dots between this target and then finding even a drug that's already been developed. I mean, how that's so much more efficient than trying to create something from scratch. So I love the approach. And, and we were also really lucky to join up with a small Swedish biotechnology company that had developed tesquinamod. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Nefedova had been in touch with them and gotten a supply of tesquinamod that she could use in her laboratory work. And when it came time to think about doing a clinical trial, it turned out that they were also really interested in looking at multiple myeloma as a potential uh, area that this drug might have an effect, and we were able to set up a collaboration 
um, where they are providing the medication and some of the funding to run the clinical trial. Um, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society uh, provided a really uh, important grant to us to run the clinical trial and also to fund some of the laboratory work that Dr. Nefedova is doing to try to figure out exactly how this medication works, what some of the resistance pathways might be, and then to also analyze the samples that we're getting from patients during the trial to see if we can identify the same kinds of effects as we give this to people as we're seeing in the, in the mouse models that she uses to study myeloma in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, will you share a little bit more information about this study? Like, this, is this a phase one study? And let's talk about all the study, study details. Sure. So, so we're actually in the middle of the study right now. I think it's appropriate to call it a phase one study um, because we are still trying out a few different things with how the tesquinamod is dosed. Tesquinamod is an oral pill. It's taken once a day, every day, and that was all worked out in patients with other types of cancer. Um, we weren't quite sure about the dosing schedule. It was typically given at a very low dose for a couple of weeks, then a medium dose for a couple of weeks, and then a full dose. And that's a hard thing to think about when you're treating people with myeloma who might need treatment right now. So we've been trying out faster increases in the dosing schedule, um, and we had thought about going to even higher doses. But the truth is, unlike other phase one studies where we're trying, starting out with a brand new medicine and trying it out at very low doses and then slowly going up and maybe getting to doses that are way too high, we were already pretty sure when we started this study what the right dosing range was going to be. And so all of the people that we're treating as part of the study are getting doses that are right there in the range that should be effective. Um, the study was written to treat some people just with tesquinamod by itself, <clears throat> and then we also decided to try using tesquinamod in combination with a standard myeloma treatment regimen that's known as IRD. Uh, the I is exazomib, also known as Ninlaro, which is a type of drug called a proteasome inhibitor. The R is, stands for Revlimid, also known as lenalidomide, uh, which most people would call an imid, and then dexamethasone, the steroid medication. And so IRD is a, a standard myeloma treatment regimen. It has the advantage of being all oral pills. So when we combine it with the oral tesquinamod pills, it's an all oral regimen, which is not such a common thing in myeloma therapy and I thought would be pretty attractive to patients to be able to do everything with just pills. The reason we yeah, picked nice. those specific medicines is because those are the medicines that Dr. Nefedova had looked at in the laboratory and found that tesquinamod could help those medicines, specifically um, ixazomib or bortezomib, which is a, a very closely related medication, also known as Velcade. And there, you could really see synergistic effects between tesquinamod and the proteasome inhibitors, and also additive effects with tesquinamod and revlimid or lenalidomide. And so the idea of putting those together, which is a standard regimen that we know a lot about giving, and then adding in the tesquinamod and really augmenting the efficacy. We're very excited to see how well it works. Yeah, wonderful. Um, because this drug has been used in other cancers, I'm sure you have some kind of safety profile like you do with the dosing. So have you seen any indication of specific side effects or things like that in addition to the, the IRD combination or alone, I guess? So we have not yet started the combination of tesquinamod with the IRD combination. That part of the okay. study just opened up, um, and we're looking for patients to sign up for that study right now here at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, the part that we've done so far was uh, we treated a total of 10 patients with single-agent tesquinamod over the past year and a half. Uh, to try to understand what kind of effects that would have. In terms of side effects, I think we've seen pretty similar side effects to what was seen 
with tesquinamide in other cancers. And in general, it's a pretty well-tolerated drug. I would say most patients have minor side effects. It can cause some fatigue. It can cause some upset stomach. Um, probably the most prominent side effect that we saw that was seen before was some pain, either muscle pains or bone pains. For a couple of patients, that's been pretty intense, but for other people, not so bad, and some people, not at all. So it's been very variable, person to person, whether the medication was causing any significant side effects. Um, we do think that the side effects are not as bad if you start off with a lower dose and then increase to the full dose. So the study right now is planning to, at most, um, escalate or, or increase the dose to the full dose after one week of treatment. And we're actually starting off with right now with one week at a very low dose, one week at a medium dose, and then getting to the full dose at two weeks, which might be exactly the way to do the, the dosing of the medication. And so overall, we're hopeful that when we add it into the IRD combination that we don't see too much in the way of additional <laughs> side effects beyond what we would expect with IRD itself, which I think also overall is a pretty well-tolerated combination. Yes, it is. Hang on one second. Okay, sorry. I had to cough for a second. Um, where is the study being run just at UPenn? Yeah, so this study is just being run at the University of Pennsylvania. That's partly because it's a relatively small study and also because we really want to have the ability to take the samples, blood samples and a couple of bone marrow biopsy samples from our patients and run them over to Dr. Nefedova's laboratory, which is located right across the street so that we can really learn more about exactly how this works. Uh, of course, if we start to see some really good effects, I imagine that uh, Active Biotech and I will think about ways to expand this to a bigger research program at other institutions as well. But right now, it's just at the University of Pennsylvania. Now, we do know that a lot of our patients travel some distance to be part of the study. And so for this particular study, we worked very hard to try to write the study in a way that would not require too much in the way of visits at the study center. So there are a couple of visits that you need to come to Penn in the first month, but then after that, it's a once a month visit to the University of Pennsylvania, and then everything else, if there's blood work that needs to be done in between, uh, we can figure out ways to do that closer to the patient's home and work with their local oncologist to deal with anything that's going on um, if they need it and really minimize the number, of, the amount of travel that patients have to do, which can be a big burden associated with clinical trial participation. Right, and this is where the all oral idea is a really good idea, so. That's a, a great trial design, in my opinion. Um, who are the ideal patients to join the study? Relapsed or after how many lines of therapy, that kind of thing? So because this is all brand new and experimental, um, the FDA really wanted us to concentrate on people who had already been through the most effective standard treatments or had some specific reason why they couldn't get them. So in, this is certainly for people with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma, meaning that they've gotten prior treatments uh, that have stopped working. And we're looking for people who have gotten all or at least most of the current most effective standard treatments. So that's usually people who have been through three or four or more prior treatments for their myeloma. And there's some reason that they shouldn't use those treatments. Either they weren't working or they were causing bad side effects. And, and so really it's for people who have been through a lot of other things. Um, and ideally for this part of the study, 
people for whom using a combination of IRD, of exazomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone would be a reasonable thing to do. So if they've gotten those medicines before, we wouldn't want those medicines to have caused really bad side effects in the past. Okay. And then also how many patients, phase one studies are usually sort of small. So how many patients are you looking to include? And you said you're you're kind of into the study already, right? We are. So we've, we've treated 10 patients so far. And part of the reason we're talking about this right now is uh, we recently made public uh, a small snapshot of those results um, where we did see that as a single agent, we had two patients whose myeloma was clearly growing when they came into the study and really seemed to stabilize for several months, four or five months, um, on the treatment so that we thought we saw a hint of an effect of tisquinamide by itself. At the same time, it didn't seem like a, a really strong effect, so we weren't wild about signing more people up to be treated with tisquinamide as a single agent and really wanted to move on to the combination part of the study <clears throat> where we really think that this kind of treatment, that bone marrow microenvironment, will have its best effectiveness. And, uh, and so we're just starting the combination part of the study, and we're looking to treat a total of somewhere between, uh, I would say, 18 and 30 patients. Um, we start off small, so right now we're looking for three people to be the first ones to get this particular combination. And if they do well, then we'll try a slightly faster increase in the dose of the tisquinamod, bumping up the dose at one week with the same combination. And then if that seems to be well tolerated, we'll try to sign up at least 12 more patients who will and try to get a sense of, well, how well does it work? And how well does it work specifically in people who have previously gotten combinations of imids and proteasome inhibitors that stopped working so that we wouldn't really expect the IRD to work on its own. And if we see some effectiveness against the myeloma, that we'll really know that it's because we added in the tesquinamide to the regimen. Right, and combining something that's going to slow the growth with combining something that's known to treat, you know, this triple combination that's known to well treat myeloma is um, a good approach because, yeah, I I and, like it. And, I think it's great. And more importantly, in the laboratory, when we added to squinamod to Velcade therapy, which is very similar to the Ninlaro that we're using, we saw that it helped kill myeloma cells better. And to mm -hmm. a slightly lesser extent, we saw the same thing with Revlimid. So we're hoping that adding the tesquinamod really bumps up the effectiveness of these other medications and makes it a much more effective regimen. Yeah, and you could think that um, once you get through this trial and you do this, I know everything starts in relapse and refractory myeloma with clinical trials, but you might think that using it in smoldering myeloma or earlier, you know, forms of myeloma might really delay that progression. And, I mean, we have patients living 10, 15 plus years, so anything that would slow that process down would be truly amazing. So I think that's really important. And, of course, I could also imagine using a medication like this in combination with immune therapies where we're trying to get immune cells to kill myeloma cells and that therefore taking a medication that doesn't have too much in the way of side effects and combining it with other therapies all along the spectrum of patients with myeloma could have a lot of effectiveness in lots of different places. It's really important to pick some place to start and because of how we think about things in drug development, we usually want to start our treatments in patients who are really in need of something new and don't have another good alternative. And therefore, if we jump in with a new medication, we really can figure out in the people who need it the most whether it's going to have any effectiveness at all. It's a lot more challenging to try out a brand new drug uh, where you're not really sure that it's going to work 
in people who would say with smoldering myeloma, whose myeloma might not absolutely need treatment right now, um, that's always a little bit more challenging when you think both about the ethics and about the practical aspects of who's really going to want to sign up for the study. But we are very excited about the possibility that if this works, it could be applicable in lots of different situations. Yeah, even high-risk smoldering where you know they're going to progress within a certain time frame or something. So that would be really interesting. Um, another question, you say with immunotherapies, and so I know you're talking about that very broadly. Let's. I know you mentioned checkpoint inhibitors um, earlier, in, and when they did the checkpoint inhibitor studies in myeloma and they combined it with lenalidomide, it did not go well for those trials. But if they're using this with checkpoint inhibitors alone, I know – checkpoint inhibitors might still be able to be wonderful in multiple myeloma, just combined with the right things. So do you think that type of immunotherapy would be selected for, you know, one of these approaches if you start seeing impact in your study? Well, on the one hand, I don't want to get too far ahead of where we are right now. And so Mm -hmm. right now I'm very focused on the trial that we're doing and really making sure we understand what effects we see of tesquinamide in combination with agents that we know we've shown in the laboratory should work better when we add tesquinamide in with them. So we're really excited about that. But I am part of a a bigger myeloma research program. My colleagues here at Penn um, and I are working on a, a wide variety of clinical trials that have all sorts of different effects on the immune system. So we are continuing to do research on uh, both existing checkpoint inhibitors and new what we call checkpoint inhibitors. And they're called checkpoint inhibitors because these are ways of blocking signals to immune cells that keep them in check, that keep them under control and not being uh, functioning to the point that they could be. And, And so when you put these inhibitors into patients, you can really turn on the immune system. And so both you know, similar medications to ones that have been tried in myeloma, but just in different combinations, and then new ones as well. And then other immune therapies where we're specifically guiding T cells to the myeloma cells to uh, to kill them, either by targeting them with uh, chimeric antigen receptors or CARs, or by using by specific T cell engaging antibodies to draw the T cells into the myeloma cells to attack them. And all of these are either new ways of treating myeloma that are approved or are investigational, but incredibly promising and likely to move into the clinic as approved treatments in the near future. And I could imagine trying uh, a medicine like tesquinamod in combination with any of these because for any of them, the bone marrow microenvironment is a constant that we have to deal with. Mm-hmm. Myeloma cells don't exist just by themselves. And, you know, when we study them in the laboratory, they behave very differently as just myeloma cells in a Petri dish than they do if you mix them with other bone marrow cells, or more importantly, if you treat them in the context of an entire living organism with an immune system and a bone marrow microenvironment. And so we know that when we're treating myeloma in patients, we're going to have to take all of that into account for any of our treatments. And and using a therapy like tesquinamide has the potential to make a real impact on any and all of these treatments. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you think about CAR-T and and maybe prolonging relapse after CAR-T, making it last longer. I mean, I don't know. There are a lot of different ways that this potentially could be used in myeloma treatment. So it's very exciting that you're investigating it, and um, especially because I know UPenn has such deep expertise in immunotherapies, and this to me is, would you consider this an immunotherapy? To me it is, because it's affecting the bone marrow microenvironment, which is part of the immune system, right? So sure, I think if you you know made a broader category of treatments that have some effect on the immune system, I think this could fit into that. I want to make sure I don't go too far because most of us, when we're really talking about immunotherapy, would concentrate much more on treatments that have a much more measurable direct effect 
on the immune system or directly harness the immune system. And this is a little bit more indirect way of trying to help that system along. Okay, wonderful. Well, I want to leave a few minutes for caller questions. So if you have a question for Dr. Vogel, you can call 347-637-2631 and press 1 on your keypad. And we had, an, an I think, an early question. We have a couple questions. So caller at 3703179. Go ahead with your question. Hi. Um, so it's a pleasure to be a part of this and to ask a question. So I have some experience in doing research in the microenvironment, and I know it's, it's often a two-way street. So there's, um, there's you know, a, a targeting the pathway to the tumor cell and then targeting the pathway that leads the tumor cell. Um, has there been any look into uh, tisquinamod, tisquinamod and um, targeting uh, tumor cell signal that is re- being released, uh, you know, kind of recruiting or, or, or calling in this uh, microenvironment? Well, so now I'm, I'm a little sad that Dr. Nepadova isn't here with us to deal with this kind of question. Um, but I, I will say that in, in this particular trial, we really do think that tesquinamod is blocking a protein that is primarily made by the tumor microenvironment, and specifically these MDSCs in the tumor microenvironment. Um, there is, I know, ongoing work that is looking at what signals come from the myeloma cells to the myeloid cells, the normal neutrophils and monocytes that then turns them into MDSCs. I'm not aware of any clinical trials that are trying to block that at this moment, and that might be in part because we're just not sure that we've identified one factor that really could be effectively blocked. Uh, but this trial is really looking then at the next step that once those cells become MDSCs, what signals do they send out that could be effectively blocked? And we do think that, that this S100A9 protein is a, a really good target. Um, and it's clear that blocking S100A9 doesn't seem to lead to bad things happening in people. And so the question is, does it provide a strong enough uh, anti-tumor effect that this is going to really be a good treatment for, for multiple myeloma in particular, and we'll only figure that out by actually trying it. Oh, very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the question. Okay. Um, caller 468-8552, go ahead with your question. Hi, Dr. Vogel. This is Cindy Chmielewski. How you doing? And... Yeah, this is really exciting. I am trying to learn all I can about this. And um, first, with these MDSCs, are there are things that you were saying look like like neutrophils and monocytes, but they act differently because in the presence of cancer, they get activated. So if you don't have cancer, do you have MDSCs? So, Cindy, that's a great question. And for those of you who don't know Cindy, Cindy is a a fantastic patient advocate um, who I've known for many years um, and always has good questions uh, to ask. And and it turns out it's it's almost a little bit uh, silly, but in, in fact, the definition of MDSCs is that they're part of what happens in the presence of cancer. So by definition, if you don't have cancer, you can't really have MDSCs specifically. Now, what you did hear Dr. Nefedova say is that we do have some ways of differentiating MDSCs from normal neutrophils and monocytes based on the types of proteins that they have on the surface of the cell. And if you look in the blood of people without cancer, you can sometimes find a very low level of cells that have those same surface proteins on the outside of the cell that we would expect to see on MDSCs. 
But if you look in people with cancer, there are a lot more of them. And we're not sure that in people without cancer that those cells have any harmful role. And in fact, because they can happen as part of the body's response to something, like many things in cancer, it may be that they actually have a useful, helpful role when you don't have cancer, and it's only in the setting of cancer that the body's normal, natural processes get somehow turned around and start protecting these cells that we really want to get rid of. And so it's possible that only in people with cancer do these types of cells have a truly pathologic role or a harmful one. Okay. Thanks. I'm trying to get this all in my head. And can I just ask one quick question about the eligibility criteria? If someone is refractory to LEN or um, ICSA, could they still be part of the trial, or is it people who are non-refractory to those two drugs? So in order to get on the study, you have to be at a point in your treatment where just doing Revlimid or lenalidomide or just doing Ixazomib uh, wouldn't or, or Ninlar wouldn't be a normal thing that you would do because if those are good options, and maybe you don't need this study specifically. Um, but more importantly, both in, in this initial part that we're signing people up to right now and a little bit later on, we're also going to really be looking for people for specifically for whom a medicine like Revlimid has stopped working and a medicine like Ninlaro has stopped working, more importantly even that the combination of those two, which is a particularly powerful combination, or at least of those two classes, has stopped working, because in those are specifically the people where when we add in the tesquinamod, we're going to know that if they have a good response, that's really because of the tesquinamod. So we are looking for people um, who have previously gotten these medicines and had them stop working, and uh, we're hopeful that when we add in this new medicine that they'll work much better than the last time that people got them. Oh, good. And, and do you know about how long to the response you would see? How long would you know if they're responding to the tisquidamod, or we don't know that yet? So I don't think we know that yet. My usual approach when I'm treating people as part of a clinical trial is to just take it step by step. So usually we think we at least need to give something for about a month to start assessing a response, and usually we want to try to give it around two months and then really assess what direction things are moving. And if it's responding by two months, you know you're good. If it's clearly growing at two months, you're pretty sure you're not going to see any benefit from it. And then if it's staying stable and people are doing well, often we'll say, you know what, maybe there will be a later response. And so as long as people are feeling okay, we'll often decide to kind of keep going and see whether we'll see a better response or at least a very long uh, period of stable disease, which for some people, if they're feeling well while their disease is stable, can be a very good outcome that we're really happy with. Okay, great. I have so many more questions, but I'll let someone else ask them. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, it's absolutely a pleasure to hear from you, Cindy, and, and from everyone else. Do you know if we have any other questions, Jenny? I think we may be running into some technical difficulties. If there's someone on the line who wants to ask a question, go ahead. Hello? I can hear you saying hello. Oh, okay. Uh, my spouse is carrying a multi myeloma on pancreas and, uh, and pavid. Uh, and he has been doing the RVD, and uh, right now the total remission about uh, at the stem for about uh, 10 years. I just wonder how how could we know she's cured? Do you have any algorithm about that? Because, you know, uh, she's looking very well all the lab she's still doing. It's, you know, pretty normal. He, we have been told it's the Etramedula plasma cytoma. So it's better uh, uh, than the regular, uh, I mean, uh, uh, 
it's the same as the multi-myeloma on bone? Well, so, so um, of course, what you're asking is, is some very specific questions, and without having seeing a patient, it's hard to know exactly all of the details. Um, but I do think that all of us in myeloma research and treatment are hoping that we're working towards the day when we can look at people and really say that we've cured them of multiple myeloma. But at least right now, I think the assumption that we tend to have is that we don't have any treatments right now that truly lead to a cure. So that for anybody with multiple myeloma, even when we've treated to a really deep response, uh, we're still watching uh, for the rest of their lives to make sure that whenever the myeloma starts to come back, we notice it early. Um, and we do see some people for whom the myeloma never manages to come back during the time that, that they're alive, and that's great. But still we assume that if we follow people for long enough, that eventually we'll see the myeloma again, and it's always a good idea to keep looking for it. And in the meantime, we're going to keep doing other types of clinical trials and trying out new medicines and new approaches until we can say that maybe we really are curing people. I think we may have somehow lost our connection with Jenny, which is too bad. And so um, I think it might be a good idea to say that we uh, had a great conversation and I really appreciated the chance to talk about the clinical trial work that we're doing and the research that we're oh, doing yes. at the University of And I'm sorry, I had put myself on mute. <laughs> I just yeah. wanted, and I was thanking you profusely <laughs> while I was on mute. Um, I just want to thank you for all the work that you're doing and in bringing these new therapies to um, to the myeloma clinic. It's really stunning to me as a patient what's happening in myeloma, and it's because of work like this and like yours. So, just thank you so much. I know we went over a little bit. I appreciate your time and Dr. Nefedova's time and expertise today. And just thank you so much for all you do for myeloma patients everywhere. Well, Jen, you're welcome. And I'll turn that right around and say thank you to you. I think that the opportunity to talk about this kind of research to patients is extraordinarily valuable, and I've really enjoyed it. I think the work that you're doing with Myeloma Crowd and with Health Tree is incredibly important, giving people a source of reliable information and a voice and an opportunity to contribute to our knowledge about multiple myeloma and how we treat it and what outcomes are. And it's such a pleasure to be able to work with you on this. Well, thank you. It's because um, I love this format because it allows patients to truly understand what this trial is all about. And this is how patients, how we as patients can contribute to our own care is by participating in trials like these. So what you're doing is very important, and we just appreciate you so much. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today, Dr. Vogel, and thank you, everyone, for listening to My Loma Crowd Radio. Uh, we'd like to invite you to join us next time to learn more about what's happening in myeloma research and what it means for you. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to Chumbacasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.